Thank you, Dr. Merker, because I don't have to give the introduction to my talk anymore, so that's going to save a couple of slides. Um, so as Mary mentioned, the, um, the work that I'll be presenting today was funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And um, I have to say the Foundation Fighting Blindness has been funding my work since I've become a, a professor 10 years ago. So thank you tremendously. We count on support of, of donors and of, uh, of the foundation to, to do a lot of these uh, research projects that are a bit out of the box and, and harder to get funded through conventional funding streams. So, so thank you very much for your support. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about a study that was a bit, again, out of the box at the time when we started doing it. Um, and it was actually the first study that proved the link between gut microbiome and any kind of uh, retinal disease. Um, and I'll just go through the whole um, history of how we came up with the idea and some of the, uh, the key experiments we did to, to prove that there is a link. Um, and also I'll try to explain or draw how you know, we can learn from this study and maybe apply some of the, um, um, the concepts here to, um, to better our, our, our general health. Um, so as Dr. Merker um, pointed out, this is uh, a healthy retina. And so we're quite interested in three different diseases. Um, and the one thing they have in common, so these three diseases are either retinopathy of prematurity, diabetic retinopathy, um, or age-related macular degeneration. Um, and so the retinopathy of prematurity affects typically infants born anywhere between 24 and 32 weeks of life. And what happens when these infants come out um, uh, of the uterus, they end up getting, um, they have immature blood vessels in their, in their eyes. And essentially, as we can kind of see here, although there's a lot of light scatter, um, these immature vessels um, don't make it all the way to the periphery of the eye. So these babies end up having um, a lot of hypoxia, meaning that their cells aren't getting enough nutrients or oxygen. Um, and to compound this problem, all the factors that the, the placenta or the, the mother gives to the infant in this last trimester are absent. So again, these, a lot of these factors are, are required for blood vessel development. Um, so to make a long story short, these babies um, first don't have enough blood vessels and then the body has a very um, nice set of programs to reinstate blood vessels. So again, blood vessels are critical to supply nutrients and oxygen to all cells and without blood vessels our, our cells don't function. Um, so once the uh, tissue senses that there's not enough blood vessels, it activates a whole series of programs um, to produce blood vessels, except in all of these diseases, including diabetic retinopathy, which has somewhat of a similar um, secondary consequence where blood vessels end up growing in an uncontrollable manner. Um, so these pro-angiogenic or pro-vascular programs are activated to, to a very high degree in a very uncontrolled manner. Now, as Dr. Merker described, there's a similar process that occurs in age-related macular degeneration. And for the rest of my talk today, I'll be focusing on age-related macular degeneration. Um, so I don't have to go into any of the um, etiology of the disease, because that was covered by Dr. Merker. Um, but essentially, one thing I'd like to point out, um, again, is that there's these two phases. So one is the, the dry form. Um, or an atrophic form that will affect pretty much most of, uh, most of the, uh, the population, so 90%. Um, and this is characterized by, one of the underlying features of it is these confluent uh, lipid deposits called drusen at the back of the eye. Um, and so these are highly pro-inflammatory. So I'll just ask you to re uh, remember that part. Um, and the second phase that affects 10%, as Dr. Merker pointed out, um, only affects around, well, yeah, affects 10%, but is the leading cause of, of vision loss associated with this disease. And so th it's unclear right now if the two are a continuum or if they're a separate disease. So not all patients will progress to the neovascular form. Um, but those who do, again, there's this whole series of interventions that Dr. Merker uh, pointed out. But one of the important things um, to know is, is there a way that our lifestyles could influence on actually um, developing or being predisposed to develop any of these diseases. 
So there's been a tremendous amount of effort to try to understand the genetics behind age-related macular degeneration, so both forms. Um, and here's just a little example of a list that's also going to be on the exam that Dr. Mercure pointed out. Um, and just the bottom line here is that most of these genes that are linked to age-related macular degeneration um, are actually mutations in inflammatory genes. So um, AMD is not a disease that is characterized by a genetic mutation. So meaning, if you have a genetic mutation, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get the disease, but it does predispose you to it. Um, so probably the most common mutation um, associated with the disease was the complement factor cascade that we saw in the last talk, and that, that will give you around 10%, chance, uh, 10 times more chance of developing the disease, but it doesn't necessarily mean you will get the disease. Um, so essentially, why are all these mutations in inflammatory genes? Well, it's probably if you go back several hundreds of thousands of years, um, or actually even less than that, um, we're not really meant to live longer than 40 years, because at the point that we're 40 years old, we should have uh, reproduced, been grandparents, and you know have our progeny be able to take care of their progeny. So w with evolution, we've selected for, for gene sets or for individuals that are extremely good at fighting off the number one killer at the time, which was infection. So we're very effective at fighting off all these infections, and the people that survived, <laughs> and hence our ancestors, were very good at fighting off infection. So then when you start to get into later stages of life, um, you realize that all of these um, aging diseases, so whether it be um, age-related macular degeneration or Alzheimer's disease or um, or you name it, um, they essentially all have a very, very profound inflammatory component. So that we can't really modify. But what we can modify um, are other factors that were also pointed out by Dr. Merker, which are um, smoking, obesity, and diet. So I'm going to focus on the last two of those, which are actually all three are, well, the first one's very easily modifiable. The other two are, are a bit more complicated, um, but have a very profound impact. So smoking is um, thought to be and, and likely the, the number one modifiable factor that can affect age-related macular degeneration. Um, but there's been some really interesting, nice studies that pointed out, um, surprisingly actually mostly in men, um, that if you have a body mass index of over 30, so meaning you're, you're relatively big-boned, let's say, um, you have um, a 2.3 chance, more, more chances of developing age-related macular degeneration. Um, and essentially, every time your whip, uh, waist-hip ratio rises by over um, 0.1, um, you have like a 13% chance increase of, uh, having, of developing this disease. So what it means is that essentially, if, um, at least in men, so the study really pointed it out in men, although I'm, I'm certain there's parallel processes for women, um, that obesity is, is, a, is a very bad condition for, for age-related macular degeneration. So I eliminated a bunch of my slides because of the last talk, um, but essentially, um, how does obesity influence AMD? And this is, this is what we've been trying to understand and what we're trying to understand uh, with this uh, um, Foundation Fighting Blindness funding. Um, and some of the studies that we've put out essentially um, were um, influenced and were uh, informing some of, um, uh, some of the clinical trials that were uh, being conducted at the time. And one of them was the ARIDS-2 study. Um, and so we had found that diets that were uh, very rich in omega-3 fatty acids were actually protective for various forms of neovascular eye disease. Um, now, when the ARIDS-2 study came out, um, the, you might not be able to see this through here, but two of the um, additives to the ARIDS-2 that they ended up removing, one was beta-carotene, because patients that were taking ARIDS-2 and had high, were taking also beta-carotenes, had much higher levels of developing certain cancers, so they took this out. Um, and the other one they took out was the omega-3 fatty acids. So this was a bit surprising, because we were certainly in the lab, we were seeing very profound effects, and, and of course, um, a, a lot of groups were seeing very profound effects. Uh, but the population they used for this study 
uh, were well-educated and well-fed. So a lot of them actually admitted to eating fish twice a week. Um, and the ones that were supposed to be on the omega-3 uh, deficient pills. Um, so I think you know, this, this is a brilliant study that has certain caveats that are important to, to understand. Um, but all that to say is that this dietary influence is, is clearly there um, for these diseases. Um, and I think just the ar arid supplements um, do provide uh, rationale for that. So I'll get to the, the whole microbiome idea. So when they were in the lab and I had this idea um, and I, I asked a graduate student if she can render a mouse obese, which is a very simple thing to do. You just give it high fat diet and take out any kind of training wheel and the mouse becomes obese. <clears throat> they like to eat. And so after the mouse is obese, um, we asked her to, and this is where it gets a bit strange in terms of the conversation, we asked her to take um, the feces of that mouse and make a suspension of the feces of that mouse and then inject it to a skinny mouse. And so, so already that is kind of a strange thing to ask a student to do. Um, <laughs> but then the, the next thing was we um, essentially asked her if, what, what happens to the, the metabolism of that of that fat mouse that you injected um, uh, uh, feces from a skinny mouse and vice versa. Um, so she did this experiment where she does a glucose tolerance test, which is, I'm sure many of you have gotten a glucose tolerance test done. So essentially either drink um, a very sugary substance. Um, in our case, we inject glucose in the, into the mouse. And you can see in the, in the top curve, that's a mouse that's not responding very well to glucose, meaning it's either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, so these are our fat mice. So the fat mice kind of show signs of you know, what we would think would be a pre-diabetic or diabetic condition. Now, the really remarkable thing was when we took feces from, and again, th th this was taking feces from a skinny mouse and giving it orally to, um, to a uh, to a, to a fat mouse, and this time they're, so the, the colors are coming out a bit strange here, but um, essentially the fat mouse started responding to glucose challenge exactly in the same manner as a healthy skinny mice. So I kind of fell off my chair when I saw that, and then we're like, this is, this is very remarkable, because we're just, again, taking feces from a skinny mouse and feeding it to a fat mouse. And this is completely ethical because mice are coprophagic, so they actually eat their own feces. Um, <clears throat> but what, uh, what it really suggested was that there was something in this fecal suspension um, that can influence systemic metabolism. Now, unfortunately for us, this was already published in Nature two years before we did the experiment. We just didn't find the study until, until we did it after. But so again, they gave more substance to the whole idea that these bacteria or something in your feces can influence your, your, your systemic health. Um, now, if we look back further than the two years that we did when we found that nature paper, you can go and see that in the fourth century BC, this doctor called Ge Hong from China was um, already giving fecal transfer um, to his patients that had food poisoning. So he found that like, if you know, his patients were having food poisoning, he would give fecal suspensions to, um, to his uh, fecal suspensions from healthy patients to sick patients, and they were doing quite well. Um, and so since then, there's been a lot of um, uh, kind of more formal studies than the ones done in the fourth century. And what the conclusion in that um, is, for example, in a disease like C. difficile, uh, if you use the current standard of care, which is vancomycin, so it's a very aggressive uh, intravascular injection of, of a pretty uh, horrible um, antibiotic, uh, you have a 31% chance of curing the disease. Now, with the fecal transfer, you have a 94% chance of curing the disease or restoring the disease. So it's already known in modern medicine um, that something in the fecal matter can actually have a very big influence on, on systemic health. Um, now, for sake of time, I'll, I'll hurry up a bit, but one of the good things about um, about the gut microbiota is that uh, it's very rapidly modifiable. So essentially, there's some studies that have shown that if you start to eat a plant-based diet, 
within, and, and you know, you previously you were heavy, you, um, you ate a lot of um, North American type diets. Um, and if you transfer to a uh, plant-based diet, within four days, your microbiome will be very similar to that of, of a vegetarian. Um, and vice versa. Then if, you, if you're a, a healthy vegetarian and you transfer it to a meat-based uh, diet, then your, micro, your gut microbiome within four days will readjust. So there's good news and bad news in that. The good news is that we can all readjust our gut microbiomes relatively reproducibly and rapidly. Now, so there's been a lot of... Um, there's a lot of numbers thrown out that there's uh, 10 times more microbes on our bodies than human cells, and this is not really true. This was done in the 70s. Somebody did a back-of-the-envelope type calculation and came up with the number 10 times more, and it's been awesome for getting funding to do microbiome work, but it's actually not really true. It's probably closer to 1.3 times the number of bacteria uh, versus human cells. But all the more so, one thing that's very clear is that the influence of these bacteria is really tremendous um, on health. And we now know that you know, very obvious diseases where it can have an impact is inflammatory bowel disease, different types of cancer, different types of diabetes, obesity, of course. And now we're starting to learn that a lot of diseases of the brain and the retina being biochemically similar to the brain um, can be influenced by microbiome. Now, we thought about looking at the link between microbiome and AMD uh, because of this one study published around 20 years ago on the genetics of AMD. So the conclusion there um, was kind of boring, actually. It was like if you had a twin that had AMD, you had a 90-some-odd percent chance of developing a form of AMD. So that's, that's very nice to know, but it's not super exciting. What we got really excited about was the side notes of that study that said that Essentially, if you're genetically unrelated, but had long-term shared environmental exposure, you had a 70% chance of developing AMD. So this is really, really remarkable. Um, so it, it kind of meant that if you're just living with someone, you can, you can actually expose yourself to getting AMD. Um, so this probably meant there were some serious environmental factors that can drive this. Um, now, the other thing, and I just put this in because I wanted to show you a picture of my dog. Uh, <laughs> But if you, if you live with um, you know, different members of your family, including your dog, um, you end up sharing the same microbiome. Um, so hopefully your dog doesn't have AMD. <laughs> so the way that we, we ended up um, designing the study was we, uh, we again fed mice high fat diets or regular diets. We gave them antibiotics to essentially erase their gut microbiomes. Um, and then, or, you know, repopulate them with, with uh, fats. And then we did a, a model where essentially we would burn the back of the retina in the mouse. Um, and what happens when we do this is that they have a, um, a response that looks a lot like neovascular uh, or wet AMD. Uh, so, and essentially based on the extent of this wet AMD, we can, we can then um, determine if our treatments are working or not. Um, so, of course, the mice that were put on high-fat diets, um, they all gained weight as they should. Uh, the antibiotics, in this case, didn't have an effect on weight gain. Um, and then when we look at here, so this looks like a very complicated series of data, um, but essentially what we see is mice that are on a regular diet, so we profiled um, using next generation sequencing, so these are these fancy new tools to look at the whole genetics of everything that's going on in different tissues. So we looked at the fecal manner, and you can see in red, um, mice that were on a regular diet had a lot of these um, good bacteria called uh, bacteriotides, and the uh, ones that were on the high-fat diets had a, less of those, and more of another uh, type of bacteria uh, family called the firmicutes. And there was a really nice review that I wish I came up with this play on words, but it says if you want to stay firm and cut, get more firma cuts in your, because that's the name of the, anyway, I thought that was quite good. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing was when you, um, when you, we put the mice that were on high fat diets and gave them just different antibiotics to kind of wipe out um, and then repopulate their, their guts, they would actually revert to what a regular um, diet mouse would look like. 
Um, so this, this was just to show that we're, we can very easily modify gut microbiomes. Now, um, here's a, a bit of that laser burn model that I spoke about where we can see that there's um, more of the green, meaning more new vessels growing in a mouse that's uh, on a high fat diet. Um, and then when we would ablate its microbiome or revert it more to a, uh, a regular healthy uh, mouse microbiome, we would get really significantly less of, this, um, of these pathological blood vessels. Um, and so as uh, I mentioned, there's a lot of inflammation in these diseases. So this is the back of, of the eye. It's a schematic uh, drone of photoreceptors and all these inflammatory cells. And as the disease gets more aggressive, we see that there's more and more inflammatory cells that come in. Um, and so we started asking ourselves, what happens to all those inflammatory cells that invade the retina uh, during progression of the disease? Um, and essentially, to make a long story short, um, when the mice had a healthy microbiome, so essentially a microbiome of a, a mouse that was uh, skinny, uh, it would have a lot less of this, these aggressive immune cells entering uh, the retina. So again, it was, it was much less likely to develop this uh, age-related macular degeneration. And so to kind of understand how this was working, um, we started looking at different parts of the body, and what we found was that um, the guts of these mice uh, were actually very permeable. So the ones that were becoming um, obese or had high-fat diets, they would become um, leaky. The guts were leaking, and once the guts start to leak, there's this whole family of different bacteria-derived factors um, from the gut that go into circulation. Um, and what this does, again, is it starts to activate all these different pathways uh, of inflammation. So there's a lot of um, uh, data here, but it's the bottom line is that um, the mice that have microbiomes of um, obese mice uh, have leaky guts that leach out a whole series of factors that aggravate the inflammation. And then, so we went back to the fecal transfer experiments, and what we saw was when we reestablish the microbiome, so essentially when we gave uh, regular, um, well, regular diet mice, high fat diet feces, or vice versa, if we took uh, feces from regular mice and gave them to the high fat diet fed, um, we would be able to, um, again, restore the microbiota. So, you know, again, fecal transfer works beautifully well um, to, to modulate the, uh, the microbiome. Um, and as a consequence, um, again, there was a slight impact on weight gain, so you can actually impact weight gain with different fecal transfers. This has been shown by several other groups also. Um, but more interestingly for us, um, just by doing fecal transfers of um, healthy mice feces into uh, fat mice feces, uh, into fat mice, we were able to significantly reduce the amount of um, diseased blood vessels in this model of AMD. And consequently, we're also able to reduce the amount of leaky guts. So meaning there's something in those bacteria of the obese mice or of the fat mice that was causing the guts to leak. Um, and again, leach out all these factors that would ultimately aggravate um, the inflammation in the back of the eye. Um, so here's a bit of a, a conclusion somatic where the high fat diets, they increase prim or select for a type of microbe that produce a whole series of factors that we're investigating, trying to understand what those factors are. Those factors end up opening up the barriers in your guts, and contents from your, your gut end up seeping into your bloodstream and very slowly activate and aggravate your immune system. Um, and if you're predisposed or if you have um, you know, those mutations we spoke about for for AMD, or if you're already starting to get some pathological neovascularization, then, then certainly this can aggravate it. Um, so we were quite excited because within six months of us publishing our study, there was a number of other studies that came out and confirmed what we found 
Um, one in, in humans, where essentially the same type of bacteriotitis or firmicates, so the same phylum that we identified in, in our mice, they were finding that their patients that had AMD had the, the exact same shift in, in bacterial phylums that we were able to, to shift just with the high fat diets. Um, and also another group uh, from Boston, um, again, I think around six months after we published our study, showed that um, the same kind of findings can be uh, attributed to high glycemia, so very sugary diets. Um, and I think this is where I'm, I'm just going to point out that high fat is not bad. I, I'm, we're not saying that you, know, you should eat less fat. Um, I think the, the important thing is, or the important conclusion here, is that it's important to have a healthy uh, gut. And you can achieve that in various fashions. So you don't have to necessarily um, be a vegetarian to do that. Um, but certainly the gut health is, is important throughout life and it's going to influence um, all sorts of processes that you know, get aggravated as we get older. So maybe I'll just quickly skip through this, but um, essentially right now we're trying to see are there any therapeutic implications into this? So doing fecal transfers are already done. It's harder to give feces than to give blood. Um, so if you're giving blood, they'll take a lot of people. For feces, you get screened, you have to come back 40 days later, then you have to, then they'll rescreen your feces and you have to make sure that you know, have some very strict guidelines to be a fecal donor. Um, <clears throat> Then also what's being produced by those bacteria that are causing the guts to leak and ultimately aggravating uh, AMD and can we design different interventions where we can reseed with either a probiotic, so uh, a compound that will favor one type of bacteria versus another, or if we can actually understand what the bad bacteria are producing or the good bacteria are producing, and if we can just give that um, instead as a, as a treatment instead of repopulating the whole gut. Um, and this. This whole concept kind of goes into the idea of personalized medicine, where um, essentially every person has an, a different type of microbiome. Um, and now with all the new technology, the next generation sequencing that used to cost you know, close to a million dollars to do per patient to get you know, whole, uh, your, your whole genome, you can now do it for under $1,000. So um, I think, I think this, this whole idea is becoming more and more uh, democratic and available, and certainly there's a lot of interest in this microbiome um, as being, you know, something that we can't overlook when we're, when we're designing personalized medicine. So again, I'd like to thank the people in my group that did this work, and I have the um, the old foundation fighting blindness, so now it's fighting blindness Canada. <laughs> thank you.